Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, we are a webinar, we are a webcast, an online show. Uh, call us what you want, <laughs> um, th but uh, that uh, description is uh, up for debate for some people. <laughs> Um, but whatever you want to call us, we are here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We, we record all of our shows, and you can go to our website, which I will show you at the end of the show, and um, watch any of our recordings. We keep the recordings there, any presentations or handouts or documentation people have used, and we um, save any links that people have shared into a, our delicious account that we have. So everything you can need will be there. Um, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, book reviews, mini training sessions, demos. Um, basically, our only criteria is that it is uh, library related, anything library related, and we will put it on the show. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations, but we also bring, bring in guest speakers from outside the commission, and that's what we have today on the line with us are actually two people who are also remote from each other and remote from us this morning. We're just crossing the whole country today. Um, John Pappas is at uh, Bucks County Free Library and he's in Pennsylvania over on the East Coast for us. There we go. Nice pictures you got there. <laughs> I, 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 I guess I'll, I love that game by the way, but I'm sure you'll get into that. <laughs> and Marty, um, I, 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 I never asked. It, first, is that how you? It's first. first. First, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Who is actually um, in Huntsville, Alabama at the moment. Um, used to be here in Nebraska previously, um, but has now um, moved on. So we're, um, yeah, we've got Marty and John both on the line here. going to talk to us about board games. Um, uh, lots of people play board games, of course, and now libraries have been getting into it for a long time. And um, so I'm just going to hand over to you guys and let you uh, take it away. Awesome. Tell us everything we um, need to know. <laughs> sure. No pressure. Um, my name is John Pappas. I'm from Bucks County Library. I'm a library manager here. Um, I've been developing uh, a board game collection for our system. Um, we have about seven branches, and we have about 100 games currently in circulation right now. Um, my eyes are not anywhere near that bloodshot <laughs> as the picture looks. Um, <laughs> And I am co-presenting with Marty First. Yeah. Uh, my name is Marty First. I am currently here in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, as Krista said previously, I was in Omaha, uh, Omaha Public Library. Um, and that's one of the uh, libraries, along with Messenger Public Library in North Aurora, Illinois, where I helped create a uh, monthly board game night, um, which hopefully will turn into a board game collection. Um, that's up to the people who are still there. Um, but yeah, this is going to be, I think, the second time John and I presented on this, and I'm really excited about it. It's going to be really cool. <laughs> All right, do you want to talk about Gloom a little bit, or should sure, I? Sure, yeah, I can talk about Gloom. Um, these are two fan cards that we did for Halloween, because um, we were feeling silly, um, from Gloom. Um, Gloom is by Atlas Games. It's a storytelling card game where, with kind of like an Edward Gorey vibe. Um, you have a family of, I think it's five members, and you want horrible, horrible things to happen to them because the more horrible things happen to them, the lower their, um, their worth score is, and when you want them to have a, the lowest possible score before you kill them off. But as you're trying to do horrible things to your family, um, everybody else is trying to do wonderful things, like get them <laughs> married and all of these wonderful things to to alter that score. It's really fun. It's a great game for Halloween, um, and you can you can the storytelling aspect. You can go really really far with it, or you can just kind of keep it nice and light. It's it's great for that. It, it's it's an adorable game, especially if you like Edward <laughs> Gorey. Yes. <laughs> okay, so before we get started. You know, we're going to do a little bit of an intro on why are we even talking about board games? Why designer board games? We're all used to you know, Monopoly and Risk and Sorry and all that. But designer board games promote creativity and increase social engagement across generations so much better than those do. You know, they're new to everybody in a lot of cases. They can be thought-provoking and challenging as well as fun. But on top of that, they help build a culture of positive social interaction between players, which are often of different age groups or social groups. Um, I know, John, you had a, a bunch, you had the Golden Gamers, I think is what it was, um, yep. which was specifically seniors. And they just from the picture, you can tell they're having a blast. Everybody can come together to play board games. doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, 
wh what your background is. It's just a great um, catalyst for that. Yeah, I think one of the best selling points I had for uh, board games and board game events uh, was the multi-generational aspect. It's mm -hmm. really easy to get a whole bunch of people, families, teens, older adults, seniors, all together into one room playing games. Right. So before we, you can go to the next one, yeah. So, um, so if you've never, you know, haven't played board games since you were a kid, it can be a little intimidating. Um, but most places have what we like to call the friendly local gaming store. Um, and, you know, these are just some tips on, you know, when you go there, <laughs> what you should do. First of all, go there. Look, look around, see what's going on, see what kind of people are there. Um, are there families? Are there you know, 20s and 30s, something's older adults, and find out what they're playing. Um, find out if that space is welcoming to new people, um, if they're welcome, you know, welcoming to all ages, genders, families, or if they cater to, you know, a specific set, like the more experienced gamers. Or do they cater only to, like, Magic the Gathering type, you know, trading card people? Do they cater only to the miniature Warhammer large-scale battle type games? You know, those are very different game shops than board game shops. Um, you should be able to ask the staff about the games, and they should be incredibly eager and willing to help you. Um, and they may even be open to building a partnership with your library. Um, I know at both Messenger and at OPL with Saddlebrook, we were able to reach out to local game stores and get them to help us not only teach us about games, um, but also lend us some demo copies and help us promote as well. They, they can be a, an invaluable resource for that. Lastly, most game stores have open gaming nights um, where you can come and play a game from their open box library, and that's a really great way, in addition to some other ways we'll talk about, to get to know the game before you either introduce it at a game night or add it to your collection, because really the only way to get a game, like to understand a game, is to play it. <laughs> um, play games you've never played before or that are outside your comfort zone. You know, if you've never played a cooperative game before, play one. If you've never played a crazy political strategy game before, play one. You're not going to break it. <laughs> I've had mixed results with, with um, game stores. Um, some have been great and, and some have been horribly unwelcoming. Um, so it, it definitely varies. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot more game stores that are staying in business are becoming more sort of entry gamer friendly. So they're promoting more family games and more gateway games, and they're trying to make the space look brighter and more welcoming. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So it really depends. I, I've had I've had a few bad ones recently. The 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 local game store that just uh, moved into my neighborhood has been really great, and they actually have a small um, demo library of games that you can play uh, right there. And they've recently offered to let our library. Um, use those for game nights. That's awesome. Yeah, I yeah. was going to mention that too. Oh, we have a gaming store here that I go to every now and then, and um, we're, we're lucky. It's They are very welcoming. Everyone who's there, um, <clears throat> you can just walk up and stand next to people playing a game and watch, and they'll start telling you how to play it. You know, strangers will say, all right, we're going to play. Well, yeah, for example, Ticket to Ride over here. Who's up? And a whole bunch of people don't know each other. will just go to the table and play. And it is very welcoming. But you do, I think, have to be um, brave about it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when you first walk in, you might not realize that these people, they might be friendly, but they're just in the middle of a game right now. But once you sit down next to someone or, you know, they're, you know, they want people who play these games want to share. They want to bring you in. <laughs> Well, I think that's the kind of feeling of, I got, yeah. Yeah, there's a little bit of online research you can do too. When In, mm -hmm. in Aurora, or in North Aurora, when we were first uh, looking to content game stores, you could kind of tell from their websites and Facebook presences and whatnot what kind of game store they were. You know, if you see lots of pictures of people playing those, you know, Warhammer type games or everything on their website is all about magic tournament, magic tournament, magic tournament, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily going to be what you're looking for. We were lucky enough in North Aurora, there were multiple game stores so we could find one that, that would, you know, had what we needed and would work with us. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to game stores, you know, that face-to-face -face people thing, um, YouTube is a wonderful, great place to learn about games. It's one of the first places that I look when I'm researching a new game um, because I don't have to leave my desk. <laughs> and, and I've even had program participants, you know, coming into monthly game night tell me that, oh, hey, before we got here, we looked up the rules to Ink and Gold, so we kind of know what's going on, which was great. <laughs> Uh, Tabletop is a show hosted by Will Wheaton on Geek and Sundry, and I think they're in their 
fourth season now? Third or fourth season. Um, they play through lots of different titles, and it's a great way to get a sense of the social interaction aspect because they're not just playing the game. They're not tutor it's not a tutorial on how to play the game. They're just playing the game. Um, so you get to, and they're talking about it and whatnot. It can be a little bit more than like PG rated, so it's a good idea at, at if times. you wouldn't work. Um, not always, but wear headphones. Um, Starlet Citadel is an online board game store, so they give lots of quick reviews of popular games, and they they update about once a month, but they've got a pretty good backlog as well. They are a store, so they don't get super critical. You know, they're they're saying, hey, buy this game. Um, Watch It Play is done by Rodney Smith, um, who at this point is a professional game explainer. So he does full playthroughs of board and card games. Um, it's a great way to understand the mechanics, um, so, you know, because it's like not, lots of close-ups on the, the actual materials and whatnot, and he's teaching you how to play the game. Um, it's great for brushing up to learn a new game or, you know, I haven't played this in a year, I can't remember, and I don't have it in front of me kind of thing. Board Games with Scott. Um, it's Scott Nicholson, and he is um, the grandmaster of games in libraries. He's specifically about games in libraries. He's got over 70 videos. He's the go-to source for what we do. He doesn't update th that channel anymore. Um, but most of the games he's talking about are still very popular and in print. He's also created lots of other resources for gaming in libraries, um, like Everybody Plays at the Library and a Gaming in Libraries video course. And from my experience, he's really accessible. You know, he's on social media. If you have a question, you know, reach out to Scott. Don't, like, spam him, though. <laughs> um, also, with uh, Starlet Citadel, their videos are usually between uh, three to five minutes long. The production quality is really good. I've tended to either include a link to their videos on with, like, a QR code, if anyone mm -hmm. still wants to use those, um, that goes out with the, the games that circulate, so that there's a really quick and easy way of either learning whether or not you like this game, um, or giving you a very brief uh, rules overview uh, to understand how to play. Uh, watch a play can go for like an hour sometimes. Like they're they're pretty pretty long, thorough playthroughs. Um, and Scott Nicholson is is just awesome. Um, I realize now that three of these uh, resources are are in Canada. Um, they're they're so far ahead of us. Well, uh, Starlet I mean, Citadel and, is a Canadian store, Rodney mm -hmm. is Canadian, and yeah. Scott just moved up to to Canada that's being right. all academic and stuff. Mm. Yeah. Well, and I think one that's not on here is the Dice Tower, I want to say. Um, they do reviews, but they all, then they talk about the mechanics and, and their experiences with the games as well. So. All right. Well, the... Um, I'll say that the, the, the major resource uh, for learning about board games and which board games you would want to use for your library is Board Game Geek. Um, it is basically the Internet Movie Database of board games, which means that, you know, 80% of the stuff could be incorrect, so you need to be <laughs> careful when you're looking through it. Um, it lets you look up games uh, by mechanism, lets you look up games by uh, theme, uh, player count, uh, length of play, so all those things you should be taking into consideration when you're looking into purchasing a game, you can search through through Board Game Geek. Uh, the, the the database is huge, and they have so many games um, that it will be almost overwhelming. So we're going to take a quick uh, a quick tour through the site um, and and work through a few of the uh, elements. Um, it is, however, uh, a important note, it, it's used mostly by enthusiasts and hobbyists, uh, so there's definitely a, a skew uh, towards the games that are included and rated. Uh, so there's like a top one. I think that the, the, the number one board game, apparently, in, in board game geekdom is uh, Twilight Struggle, uh, which is a two-player Cold War uh, card game that can take a very long time. It's very relatively complex. Um, so, despite it being number one, it may not be the best fit for uh, a gateway game sort of collection at a library. All right. All right, we are at Board Game Geek. And a few things I want to point out. Down here we have the hotness. I hope everyone is seeing this. Um, this will show you uh, currently the most popular games that are coming out. It changes often. 
Um, it's basically stuff that has a lot of buzz around it. So if you're looking at games that are maybe ready for pre-order or stuff that has long been out of print but people are interested in it again, this is a good place to, uh, to look through. Uh, generally for my use, um, I use the advanced search. And this will let you search through a few things. So if you are looking at starting a new library collection and you wanted the minimum age to be six years old, so you wanted generally, you know, games for, uh, for, for most age groups, you could, uh, you don't want two player games, you want high level, you want to be able to play with a lot of people. So we'll go four to eight, and you want games that are going to play a minimum of, we'll go 45 minutes and submit. And it'll pull up games that hit all those criteria for you. You can also go by uh, category or mechanism if you want to get really specific. I use that a lot when I'm trying to create um, the set list, you know, the, the menu for board game night, so that way you don't have every single game isn't the same mechanic. Or when I'm trying to figure out a scaffolding, like, well, we want to start doing deck building, but what's a really easy deck building game versus one that's a little bit more complex? And also this is going to show you one of the difficulties with using Board Game Geek, is right now it pulled up all the games according to that criteria, and not a single one are in are in print. Okay, there's one. Seen it. Disney is in print. <laughs> but most of these are, are out of print. You can tell they have a shop on the side. Um, if They usually show like the Amazon cost and the MSRP of the game. If they don't, it's a good chance that it is currently um, out of print. Uh, so, I mean, that is unfortunately uh, one of the difficulties with using it. Um, so you just go back, tweak your search a little bit, and and give it another go. Uh, the other thing you can do is browse by games, and this will show you all the games. So there's almost 80,000 games in this in this database, and this will show you the top rankings. And there's Twilight Struggle, Terra Mystica, Caverna, Through the Ages. These they're all very fairly complex games. They're all mostly in stock. You'll see how much they cost. They're a little bit pricey. Uh, I like to go through family games. And this will give you more gateway games, more approachable games to newcomers. And they should have an ability to... Uh, I feel bad that I'm about to complain about my library's internet access <laughs> connection. There we go. All right, so we have 1,500 family games. That's a, a little bit better. And these will be games that are almost all in, in, in my current collection. Um, so Seven Wonders, Stone Age, Pandemic, uh, Ticket to Ride, Splendor. Carcassonne, Small World, King of Tokyo. Uh, these are generally easier games. They're not as complex as, as some of the, uh, the other games we saw. Um, these are ones that are generally a good place to start uh, your collection with. Uh, let's see. There we go. <laughs> Took me a little while there. You're good. All right, and I'm sure we're going to have... I think we have a question break. Questions, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, does anybody have any questions um, while we're here? Um, does anybody... Um, if you want to type into your questions section, your go to webinar, you can do that, or I can unmute you and you can ask your question that way. Um, we do have a comment when you're talking about going to the 
gaming stores and stuff that um, Dave Mixdorf, who's the director here at our um, South Sioux City Public Library, says that they have a Siouxland gamers group that comes to the library and teaches um, people how to play games. That's amazing. So they've that is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of times if you use Meetup.com, which we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. um, you can almost I would, you're almost guaranteed to find a local group uh, that would be approachable about teaching games or demoing games. Mm -hmm. And on Board Game Geek, where you were, I think, is that where I've seen where there are local, like, um, forums for your local area where you can see what's going on? Yeah, I don't, I don't use the forums that much, uh, but, yeah, they do, they do have a pretty robust forum. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, I, I don't use it that much only because it tends to be more... More hardcore they're, gamers, more, more very, experienced yeah. gamers. Mm. Enthusiasts. Enthusiasts. <laughs> <laughs> very um, serious, yeah. <laughs> so if you're if you're just jumping into this, um, I, I generally sort of avoid the forums unless you have specific questions about a game. Mm -hmm. In that case, when you go to the actual game, um, you'll find uh, rules questions, player aids, right? Uh, yeah. Strategies, all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. Reviews, yeah. videos. We do have a comment about Board Game Geek. Actually, someone who is also a gamer says uh, a new version is currently in beta of the awesome. website, so hopefully it will be more friendly for new users. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. I, I've, I've, I've heard that that was happening for a while. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, it, it, I, don't, I don't know what my brain will do when I see a, a, a user-friendly <laughs> version of Board Game Geek. Either cry or rejoice or both. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I just, I just stare at it. <laughs> now we have some because questions. Go oh, go ahead. I was going to say there's so much good information there, but navigating is, that site yes. can be really difficult. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I've had that. Um, we do have a whole bunch of questions coming through. I wonder if these are things that you're going to be covering, like um, what kind of, uh, how many copies of games do you recommend for a game night? Do you circulate them? Do you let them leave the library? Must-haves, budget amounts, is that kind of stuff you're going to be getting into? Yep. All right. Definitely. All right. We'll hold some of the questions then, huh? <laughs> oh, no, we're good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so those are the kind of questions that are coming in. So um, why don't we have you guys continue then, and we'll see if any of this stuff doesn't get mentioned, and we can definitely go back and make sure that anything you guys are talking about um, that you guys are asking about uh, needs to be covered. Sure. All right. Um, I'm going to discuss a few elements that make modern games different than the games that you may have played as a, as, as, as a young adult or a child. Um, that is me in the background screaming. I'm playing an awesome game called Letters from Whitechapel. Uh, I was uh, playing uh, Jack the Ripper. Um, so maybe not appropriate to some uh, – to say, definitely a more adult theme on that one. Uh, so uh, most of the modern board games um, have deeper strategy and more tactical decisions than you may be used to. Uh, strategy is uh, long uh, long-term thinking. Strategy is more – uh, short-term decisions. Uh, for example, in the game Carcassonne, uh, the strategic element is to decide uh, which potential paths to victory a player may try to take. Um, she may try to build larger cities, focus on farms, build really long roads, uh, or even more broadly, she could plan on playing a defensive game or a nice game, um, building her own cities and roads and farms, or play an offensive game and attempt to block other players. Uh, the, the tactical elements come from the random tiles drawn each round. Um, as the game board changes, players will have to make quick decisions in order to solve smaller, more pressing problems. Um, if you compare this to something uh, like, I don't know, Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. you, you, you have much less decisions, uh, much less uh, strategy or, 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 or tactical decisions to make. Um, <clears throat> So also, it's a good thing to, to see how what, what you would prefer to play. Do you like planning ahead, um, or do you prefer thinking on your feet? Personally, I prefer tactical games. I'm I'm a horrible strategic planner, uh, but I but I really like uh, um, watching a game board change and have to, to switch my my uh, my tactics. Uh, so a few games that would be good for strategy would be Power Grid, uh, Dominion, or Agricola. Um, and good games for tactics would be Dixit. Small World, and King of Tokyo. 
Uh, later on in the talk, I will show you some uh, sheets I have for each of these games um, that you'll be able to download or peruse at your leisure uh, explaining each. Another attribute of designer board games is a wider decision space. A wide decision space provides players with uh, more options, more choices, and more agency during their turn. A wide decision place, uh, space creates a rich, engaging, and mentally chunky experience. However, a wide variety of options can easily overwhelm and intimidate new players, causing stress and frustration. So the more, the more decision space you have in a game, the more complex the game likely is, the more rules you'll have to learn and, and know. So if people are used to board games with a single sheet of paper as the rules, most of these games, even the simpler ones, uh, will have more than that. So um, this is also why it's important to to teach, host, and, and explain some of these games. Um, <clears throat> uh, a few games that would be good for a small decision space. Ink and Gold, which the core decision is, do you go or do you stay? It's a press your luck game. Uh, Forbidden Island, um, you have four actions on your turn. It's a cooperative game. You can either move, uh, sandbag, or, or keep a tile from flooding, uh, or collect treasure. Uh, ticket to Ride, you have one of three actions. You can take cards, lay down tracks, or collect more tickets to score points. Um, so those are some that have a, a small decision space, and they're also generally easy to teach pretty quickly. Uh, for a larger but still manageable decision space, you have games like the Manhattan Project, where you have a wide array of things to do during your turn. Uh, Stone Age, where you similarly have, um, uh, you, can, you can collect different resources, you can build huts for points, you can collect cards, there's a lot more stuff you can do. Um, and also Takinoko, which is an adorable game with a panda, but you do have a lot of choices in those games. So, oops. Uh, so, uh, player interaction. Um, we're going to be discussing that a little bit more later on in the talk, uh, but I think it's one of the more important decisions you have to make when you're developing a collection, is how you want your players to actually interact with each other. Um, it's something that may be overlooked. Oh, I'm going to keep on hitting that. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see, innovative mechanisms. Um, game mechanics uh, are the inner workings of a game. Uh, the engine under the hood that moves the game along. Uh, game mechanics are broader than just the written rules of the game, but the rules will help realize the mechanics during gameplay. Some games are simple with only one or two mechanisms governing how a game is played. Some more complex games have several different mechanisms blended together, existing separately, or even feature new and novel uh, game mechanisms that have not been used before. A good example is, the, uh, is deck building as, as a game mechanism. It is uh, now used in quite a few different games, but Dominion, I think, was the one that's, that was the first one to use it. Um, so when it came out, it was a completely new game mechanism that people were able to, to interact with and, and designers to design new games around. Um, it's also a good way of ref uh, referring new players to games they may like. If they like a particular game that has a particular mechanic or mechanism in it, um, it it's a good chance that they may like similar games to that. So if someone plays a game called Sushi Go, which is a card drafting game, uh, there's a good chance that they would also like Seven Wonders, which is a more car complex uh, uh, card drafting game. Uh, let's see, narrative potential or theme. Uh, these are the story elements that provide the context for a game. Um, if mechanisms provide a framework and sort of like a scaffold for, for how a game operates, uh, the, the theme uh, provides the color and fills out the game. Uh, themes can be historical in nature. They can be nearly non-existent or just merely pasted on. They don't play a huge part in the game. Um, or they can blend well into the mechanisms of the game to create an immersive experience. A good example is Letters from Whitechapel, the game I'm playing in the picture. Uh, the mechanics are really simple. Um, Jack moves around the board. It's a, it's a, a, a map of, of London that you are moving around secretly. Uh, the rest of the players are all investigators trying to hunt you down and locate where you are. Um, it's very simple, but 
it's very immersive. Um, if you're playing Jack, you're going to feel uh, trapped and cornered as investigators sort of move in on to where you are. And if you are playing as the investigators, you can definitely feel frustrated and confused if Jack is playing a particularly good game and moving out of your way. Okay, so just like pretty much anything we offer at libraries, not all players are going to like every game. Not all players, or not all readers like every book um, that you offer at a book club, and that's okay. You just need to find out what kinds of games your patrons expect and like to play, and then try to choose games that go with that. Some games are going to be loud and boisterous and just go crazy, while others are going to be more quiet and studious with everyone kind of looking at their pieces and figuring out what to do next. Um, and that's something to keep in mind when you're deciding what games you're going to put on your, you know, your set list, your menu for board game nights. Um, if you do in-house checkout, you know, you get it from the desk and you're going to be sitting in the library with the game. Um, circulating is not that big of a deal, but a nice variety is, is good. Um, we've already talked a little bit about social interaction. We're going to get into, into it a little bit more in depth now. Um, I would say we'd stop for questions, but I feel like we're going at a good a good clip. I don't know if there's any more so far. Yeah, I'd say keep on going, and it's, you're okay. probably getting to a lot of the questions that they've, like I said, okay. they've in there, and then we'll see at the end if we need to jump, jump back to any of them. All right. So like we've already said, social interaction is one of the biggest appeals of modern board games. Um, and how much and what kind of interaction is going to depend on the game. Um, the first type we'll talk about are solitary games. They still have player interaction, but it's really minimal. Um, instead of you know looking at what someone else is doing or, or trying to bump them off, um, players are focused on their own thing, whether that's building their own deck of cards, collecting a set, or some other kind of mechanic. It's kind of this alone together situation. You're competing for resources, goals, or time that can be rich, engrossing, and a lot of fun. Um, they may not take the main stage at your game night or be the things that get checked out a lot, but they are definitely a great thing to have. The next one here is friendly competition. This is my favorite kind of game. <laughs> uh, these games usually involve a shared board with everybody having their own objectives. Um, this is, the picture here is of Ticket to Ride. So you're trying to create routes with your color trains to get from one city to another in order to score points. Um, and you can obviously get in each other's way because there's only one board. <laughs> um, because you're sharing those limited resources or you know navigating that same space, um, you're trying to get there first, there's that sense of friendly competition. You're not out to get anyone, there's no player elimination usually in these, but your actions get in the way of somebody else, like claiming a route that would have helped someone complete a larger strategy and ticket to ride. So friendly competition, you see a lot of that, you know, strategy versus tactics thing as well. You know, you may say, oh, I'm going to go this way. Oh, wait, no, I can't. Now I have to, you know, think on my feet and figure out a different way to, to achieve that goal. The opposite, well, Compared to friendly competition, you also have direct competition. Um, they have that confrontation element, and they can be viciously cutthroat. They can also be very intense and fun, but when playing in a library setting, it's good to keep a good idea to keep an eye on everyone just to make sure everybody's having fun. It's real easy to get, you know, these can get really intense. <laughs> players take actions that cause other players to lose, and that's what makes these games so engaging. It isn't everyone's style, though, so it's a good idea to balance direct competition games with their direct opposite, which is cooperative interaction, which we'll get into. Um, this guy is playing Small World, where you battle other players with fantasy races for control of a small island in order to accumulate points and win the game. It's a lot like Risk, only it's, instead of having, you know, the entire planet Earth, you have this really small island, and you have orcs and dwarves and elves instead of countries. So next is cooperative interaction. This is really unlike any of the other board games we've talked about, because instead of competing against each other or even competing you know, to be the, the, the person who wins, you're all working together to achieve a common goal. Um, the game is pretty much in all of these cases trying to beat you. Um, either that's killing you off or you know, making it so that you lose. Um, the game itself is the antagonist then. All right. Um, I'm going to burn through a few game categories. Um, these will be the type of games that you'll have in your collection. Uh, a lot of these will be pretty familiar to you. Um, 
let's start. Um, classic games. All right, so these are the abstract board games that most people uh, are practically born recognizing and knowing. Um, games like chess or go, uh, checkers, cribbage, dominoes, parcheesi, some of your standard 52 card deck card games. Um, these are pretty common. Um, we have these in our library. We do not have these checked out because most families have them in some form at home. Uh, we do have a lot of these games out for play inside the library, and I think a lot of libraries uh, do that already. Party games. This is one of my favorite ones. This one is called Skull. Um, as you can tell, it's got loads of skulls in it. Um, we tend to think of party games as trivia games um, or simple dexterity games or games where you're pretty much embarrassing yourself in front of your friends or family. Um, however, uh, party games are usually ones that encourage social interaction throughout the entire game rather than focusing on winning or strategy. Uh, they are distinguished from more complex games by a simpler setup, quicker to learn rules, minimal components, and accommodations for larger groups. All these elements are really good for games circulating through your library. Um, with a simple setup, you can teach a game at your circ desk to try to, to upsell it a bit. Um, quick to learn rules means it's more accessible to people who haven't played games in a while. Uh, minimal components means it's an easier check in and check out and less lost pieces, which I'll talk about later. Um, and also it's accommodating for larger groups. I find that a lot of the games that move at the library are games that play usually more than four people. So games where you can get a good six or seven people playing um, tend to be the ones that are more popular. Uh, if you want to know about, more about Skull, it's a really uh, simple bluffing game. It's like a condensed poker. You're basically bluffing as to whether or not you have a skull hidden on your on those little um, uh, coasters there. Uh, it's also a good game to bring with you to bars, um, <laughs> as you can tell from the picture. Gateway games. Uh, gateway games are the core of our um, circulating collection. Uh, a gateway game is any game with simple rules, um, easy to teach, plays in less than an hour, um, and generally are good for attracting new people to the hobby and still engaging for people who have been playing games for years. Um, these are games that can take the gaming experience one step beyond your standard mass market games like Monopoly. Uh, since experiences will vary across different people, Making a definitive list of gateway games to use for your library is difficult. Either way, um, if you're planning for one, um, these will be a good one to have the majority in. Um, at this point in time, you can find a lot of these gateway games at Target, Walmart, Barnes & Noble. Um, there's a lot of good online re uh, re retailers. They're inexpensive, um, so compared to a couple of years ago, these are a lot easier to find. Filler games are a bit simpler. Um, they're games that you generally play in between larger games. Uh, these are games that I also have in our circulating collection. I use these more for game groups. They have not circulated particularly well at my library. And although they are simple, they're easy to teach, they play fast. Um, they have really cute cards and pictures like Sushi Go. Um, but they have not been pos uh, all, all that popular, and I'll show you a little later why I think that is. That being said, if you want to convince people to get into uh, board gaming, um, they're a good one to use at gaming groups to play fast or to uh, use at, at a circ desk or a reference desk to just demo real quick. Bait games. These are ones that are really good to set up in front of people. They're ones that when you see people playing them, you want to jump in and play as well. Uh, this is Scott Nicholson's category. Um, they're very visually attractive, like the game Rampage in front of you, now known as Terror in Meeple City, because they probably got sued by whoever made the video game Rampage. Um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's a game that when you set up and people and you start playing it, you're going to stand up, you're going to cheer, you're going to have a lot of fun, people are going to walk around and wonder what you're doing. It's not a somber experience. Um, these are also the ones I tend to play at board gaming groups in the library, and people will stop by and wonder what we're doing. So we put this section in with game categories, even though these can really be applied across the board. So a, a way to think about these 
is, a, is, is that games exist on sort of a scale between thematic on one end and strategic on the other. Um, thematic games are games that are more thematic tell a story through the gameplay. Um, we had the picture earlier of John playing Letters from Whitechapel. They're incredibly immersive. People are going to be talking about that game. I love using that picture because you can just tell that that was a moment, you know. Um, they're going to be so immersed, they're going to tell those stories. Um, there are lots of different kinds of thematic games. There are fantasy ones, post-apocalyptic, science fiction, horror, and games that have a historical context, like this one is bootleggers and Letters from Whitechapel, which we saw earlier. On the other side of that scale are the strategic games. Um, if in thematic games you're telling a story through the gameplay, you know, how the game is played, in strategic games you're using those mechanisms to solve a problem. Um, there are often many different ways to win, um, and any theme that's applied is kind of just a dusting, you know, it's this is why the, col the color or the cards are this color, or this is why we're using this type of art. Um, interaction is a lot more gen gentle. There's less direct competition and more competition for resources or control of the board. Um, players are going to be more focused on their own little tableau or what they've got going on rather than how they can get in somebody else's way or knock them out. All right. So I know we're going to get into game mechanics. Um, I'm assuming that we're answering questions as we go here um, with just what we're, what we're doing. Um, like we said before, game mechanics are how the game works. It's what the gameplay looks like, what kind of actions the player take. They're the platform, sort of, you know, that under the hood thing that the theme and the strategy and the social interaction are riding on top of. We talked a little bit about cooperative games earlier as a social interaction. It's also a mechanic. They're the games where instead of people playing against each other to emerge the winner, they're all a team trying to beat the game, um, which is trying to destroy them. Um, I made the realization last night, Jumanji, although it's fictional, is kind of the ultimate cooperative game because the game is literally trying to kill you. <laughs> but some great gateway games for cooperative, uh, the cooperative mechanic are Forbidden Island or Pandemic. Um, Forbidden Island, you're trying to you know, get these treasures and escape the island before it floods. And Pandemic, you're all um, medical researchers and sort of the um, support team for that, trying to rid the world of four diseases before everybody dies. Real-time games are kind of a mad scramble. Um, most games are work on that turn-based mechanic that we're very used to when we think of you know, the traditional classic games. Um, Real-time games, instead of working on that, everybody's doing something at once. Um, it's that sim simultaneous action. Um, Escape, Curse of the Temple is a great real-time action game. Um, and there's a space theme one that the name is escaping me right now. John, do you remember it? Uh, uh, Dice Duel. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, <that> um... <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, worker placement games involve getting your worker pawn, usually like a little game piece, to a resource or um, an area before someone else does, because obviously only maybe one or two um, pawns can be in that space. You have lots of options, um, but if someone gets to something before you, you have to think on your your feet to bounce back. Um, two great way, two great gateway worker placement games are Stone Age and Lords of Waterdeep. Um, Lords of Waterdeep is fantasy themed with the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Um, area control is basically risk. Um, you've got a, uh, a shared game board and whoever has the majority of influence in a particular area on that board gets some sort of advantage. Um, like in risk, you know, seven extra men at the beginning of every turn if you have Asia. Um, since this mechanic is based on geography, a lot of these games have either a political or military theme. Um, Las Vegas is a great introduction to this, so is Small World. All right, games collections. Um, I think that would probably be a good time to maybe answer some of the questions that have come up related to this mm -hmm. so sure. far. Um, All right. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's see. Well, and this is actually something. Uh, what games are must-haves for a new collection? Like, what's your top ten? I, 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 I have a list of six at the end of this talk. Okay, perfect. All right, so look for that. Um how about a reasonable budget amount for a beginning a collection for a small library that serves about 5,000 people? Um, the the budget I had for my first wave uh, was about 700, and that was more than okay. enough. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, the the seed collection that I I will list at the end cost about two hundred dollars. Um, so you can knock that in half, and I think that'd be more than enough. Uh, mm-hmm. If you end up the 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 circulating collection will move, mm-hmm. and you'll 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 rarely see them. Um, the only reason I think you'd need more is if you wanted to have more gaming. Uh, Groups at your library. If you want to have more gaming events, mm-hmm. um, then you tend to need uh, maybe a, a better menu of, of games than just circulating. And we have a, a question related to that. For doing a gaming night, do you recommend multiple copies of the same game or just a whole bunch of different ones? I do both. I generally have a nice selection of games and then I feature one game. So if the featured game was Ticket to Ride, I would have one or two copies of Ticket to Ride. I personally have two copies. The library has a copy, so I can get enough of that. Otherwise, when I advertise it, or advertise the program and say we're featuring that game, I ask people to bring it in if they have a copy. Generally, one or two people will, mm-hmm. um, and that usually gives me enough. Yeah, um, sure. If I only have one copy, then I'll have a lot of gateway games out there, a lot of filler games, and then I will offer to teach that one. So newcomers will have a game that they can be taught and feel comfortable, and then people who are more experienced have been – to a few events or have played games for years will bring their own or sit down with other people and, and play their own game. Mm-hmm. And then we do have a, the, list, the, game, the list of games you're going to have, we have a couple of questions about wondering if you're going to have a list for um, recommendations for particular age groups, like certain games for teens, older, younger. I, I, I don't hear, but um, the, the games I, I recommend to start are family games, and they're usually good between, I would say, eight on up. I mean, they're generally simpler, mm-hmm. um, uh, but I, I can totally recommend games for teens or types of games for teens. Mm-hmm. That was one of the specifics, time. yeah. Was, do you recommend, would, would, I probably want to get teens involved in there. <laughs> teens were a big one. Yeah. I, yeah. I would say so, social deduction games are absolutely the best. Mm-hmm. Um, those are games like, uh, let's see, uh, One Night, Ultimate Werewolf, Coup, Masquerade, um, probably. Masquerade, yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, bang the dice game, if you don't mind, like a Wild West theme where y- you potentially are shooting people. <laughs> um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty light. It'll probably be fine. I mean, mm-hmm. so you, you want games with a lot of social interaction. So uh, those uh, social deduction games, if you go to Board Game Geek, board game geek <laughs> and, and search uh, for social deduction games, you will find a load of them. Um, they're easy to teach. They play large groups, and the or, or the resistance and the resistance mm-hmm. Avalon are, are another good one. Um, they're inexpensive. They're easy to set up. The rules will you'll learn pretty quickly, and throughout the game, everyone's going to be laughing, lying, bluffing, <laughs> uh, naming each other. Um, so it'll be boisterous, and I think generally mm-hmm. teams and and young adults. And also adults. Really adults, um, absolutely, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All Resistance right. Avalon almost always comes out, and I haven't seen One Night Werewolf since we bought it like six months ago. It, it's been <laughs> it's constantly, constantly being checking. used. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Okay. And actually, that's what a lot of our questions now that I've got left here are specifically about the mechanics of circulating the games. Do you let them leave the library? Um, best sure. practices? Um, how do you? Re- what about when parts go missing and all that kind of thing? All um, right. So well, is that, that I can talk thing? about. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so cataloging. This was the, one of the biggest issues and concerns with uh, the games is, is how we're going to catalog them. Um, what I ended up doing, and here I'll show you one of the games. This is Roll for It. Um, remember when I was saying this, the smaller games weren't circling that well? I think this is potentially why. Uh, we loaded the front of the cover with uh, um, labels. Uh, you can't tell what it is. You can't tell if it's fun. You don't know anything about it other than it has 30 cards, 24 dice, and rules. Um, so I think these are good. I, I like having each of the games has an inventory list in it. Um, I made these alignment sheets. I'll provide a link later. Um, this goes into each game. It shows a description of the game, who it plays, how many, and then gives uh, a detailed inventory. Each of these items are bagged in the box. So for the train cars, um, they're 240. We have 45 in each bag, and then we have a bag with extra cards uh, or extra cards, cars, um, and then the, the cards are separated into bags as well. Basically, every component is bagged up and labeled. Um, 
the boxes then go on the shelf like this. We have them banded on the side. Um, these are four corner four corner rubber bands. You can buy them at Staples. They're really good to keep a box uh, tight. We originally had them displayed as um, in bags or 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 or, or um, dummy cases. We would have out. The dummy cases were confused with video games, uh, and no one was happy with that. And the bags, without actually seeing the game, despite signage, no one was really interested in them. They actually just want to know how to buy the bags. Um, so the games go out on shelves, um, dedicated space or display space, um, front out so that the covers will grab you. Um, and as soon as we did that, everything moved, except for... These, the little games, yeah. The little games that had tags all over them. I'm trying to convince and, them to put the tags on the back. Yeah, and to give people a sense, if they've never seen one of these, like the the Sushi Go box is maybe four inches by six inches. Yep. Um, Panic Lab is the same way. It's a and, and Panic Lab's not even really thick of a box. They're not very big. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when you're using massive labels like that, and yeah. you can see there this bit comparing the size of that barcode at the bottom. Right. That one that can we realize what size that is? Yeah, and I see what you're saying. That's like you know the covers of a book. That's the selling. That's how you sell things, catch their attention. And if you've covered up the cover of the um, yep. board game, our, our, yeah. big, our biggest, our, our best circling uh, game is Escape Curse from the Temple. I don't have a picture of it, but it's got a very Indiana Jones sort of um, right. action adventure sort of feel from it. It's a it's a complex game. It's it's a tough one to learn. It it circs nonstop. It is easily the most popular game, and I think a lot of that is the box art. Mm -hmm. um, so why not display it? Uh, the games circ for two weeks, um, with one renewal. Uh, missing pieces, rare. I think out of the hundred games we have circing right now, uh, one game citadels. Uh, was was is is missing in action, um, and other than that, we've had two pieces uh, gone missing. Uh, a little token from a racing game called Jamaica, and I think a bit from Settlers of Catan that was easily repre replaced. Um, so so parts rarely go missing. Uh, one games are checked out and checked in. Um, we have an inventory list. We have the bags. We count them really quick, just making sure everything's there. A lot of the games I chose, um, you can miss a few pieces, and it won't make a huge deal for gameplay for, for beginning players. Um, and then every once in a while, I'll go through and count and make sure everything's there. But rarely does anything go missing. People have been really careful with, with the games that are circulating. For the one that you said you had to replace, someone did actually ask this earlier. Um, how do you, how, if you do need to replace something, do you have any tips on how you get like just one piece is missing or something? Is that? I I, I go with um, I find games that have very simple pieces, like uh, mm -hmm. Kingdom Builder, just has these little house tokens for the most part. Um, those are easy enough to to replace. Um. You can you can buy those from a few online re, 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 retailers. Uh, they're not that big a deal. I've also contacted publishers uh, when stuff is missing, and they've been really good. Like cards, cards that are very specific to gameplay that you need, mm -hmm. and they've been pretty good with replacing them. Some games like Ticket to Ride actually come with replacement parts. Um, other than that, it hasn't been too bad. Oh, well, they send extras to begin with as part, I mean, as yeah, part so, of the game. Yeah, Ticket to Ride does. Yeah, yeah they um, know something's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> they, they know you're gonna you're gonna lose one or two cars, so we have some extras there. Um, but games like Carcassonne, where it's mostly tiles and a few meeples, those little people tokens um, that you use, you can buy those separately. They're generally pretty cheap. Some just use wooden cubes. Those are also easy enough to find. But in the long run, while I budgeted money for replacement parts, I have not had to use, really use it yet. Mm, nice. John, I do want to point out your your games at your in your collection are holdable, correct? Yes. Okay. People uh, people can place holds, and actually the most the most requested through holds has been Ticket to Ride. It tends to have a five hold queue on it at all times, which means I never get to use it for board game events. <laughs> um, this is uh, okay. Donations from publishers. Are good. Okay, if you don't want to spend a lot of money, 
And I'm going to recommend a Facebook group to visit. Um, and they have a list of all the publishers. It's the... The League, the League of Librarian Gamers. Gamers. Yes, there we go. Um, everyone can see how popular I am on, on Facebook. Um, I would join here. They have publisher donation contacts. And you can open it up and it will show you all of the success we've had at other uh, contacting game publishers and, and who will provide stuff. Um, some never respond, some never respond and then send games randomly. Some are re really good. I think uh, the two I've had the most success with have been Rio Grande games right here. Um, this is not my picture. Is this my picture? <laughs> No, no, this is when I contacted Rio Grande yeah, Games okay. when I was working at Messenger Library in North Aurora. This right. is what they sent me. Um, some of it was yeah. really cool. I've never played Pressure Cooker. It has lots of tiny pieces. Um, but Monster Factory is amazing. It's a tile placement yeah, game. They got that one too. Yeah. Um, so this this is just what they sent me. And one of the things that Rio Grande wanted to know was, because we at that point only had a game night, um, wanted to know if they would be available for circulation. They were really excited about that. And they actually, when they sent the boxes, had um, stickers on them already that, you know, this was a, a demo copy, you know, not for retail sale kind of thing. So I, I think two really good ones to start. If you just want to, if you don't want to spend much money at all and you just want to try to get some free stuff really quick, I would say contacting Rio Grande and Mayfair Games. Mm -hmm. um, Mayfair recently sent me a big box of stuff. Um, they will send you stuff generally that they are unable to sell, maybe because the box is a bit banged up, um, or they will send you stuff that they've used for demos at um, conventions. Uh, but right. either way, all the pieces are there, everything's in good shape. You may need to fix up the box a bit, but mm -hmm. you can pretty much grab them and, and get them out the door uh, pretty quickly. I, I want to point out, this is what we received at Messenger Library um, when we contacted them, but I think Rapid City Public Library, when they contacted Rio Grande Games, got a different collection. So yep. you never really know what you're going to get, but they're generally going to be all usable good games. Yep, I didn't get these same. I didn't get Race for the Galaxy or Pressure Cooker, but Dominion has been great. Monster Factory is a really good kids game. It's like Carcassonne, but you're building <laughs> monsters. It's really cute. Um, Pinata is a nice little two-player game. Renaissance Man, I've actually never played. I don't have that one circling. It's really thematic, if I remember correctly. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I haven't played it either. <laughs> All right. Um, acquisitions. Uh, you have a few options, I think. Let me get this back to... There we go. Acquisitions. Uh, where to buy the games. At this, this is, it's getting a lot easier. I've, I've tried to work through board game distributors... And I have had no luck because you need to be a certified retailer in order to um, work through them. I'm still trying to convince a few to, to make exceptions for libraries uh, because then you would be able to purchase at cost multiple copies and um, they would be able to – you'd also have someone – if you didn't have someone on staff that was really knowledgeable about these games, distributors have loads of people um, that would be able to recommend good games for, for your demographics. Mm -hmm. uh, but as of yet, I have not found a distributor willing to work with me. So that leaves me with either picking out games that are local at Barnes & Noble and Target, which is generally pretty easy at this point in time. A few years ago, it wasn't, but now you can find a lot of good gateway games that I'm going to recommend um, there. Um, there's also online um, stores that are pretty good. Uh, cool Stuff, Inc., generally has a 20% discount off the um, retail price of the games and orders above 100 ship for free. So you can, you know, order, and they generally have a good uh, selection. Um, it's a good possibility. I don't recommend Amazon because I've noticed sometimes prices on Amazon do not reflect how much you should be spending on these games. Yeah. Um, so if you have a friendly uh, local game store, I would recommend purchasing from them as well. However, you generally don't get good discounts from a brick-and-mortar store. Um, it's good to support local economy, and I love seeing game stores uh, thrive. Um, but generally, you don't get a, a lot of bang for your buck from from game stores. We were able to, in Aurora, show our tax-exempt letter, though, at our local game store, so we at least got 
that. I mean, we didn't get a discount on top of it, but we did get, you know, we were tax exempt um, in addition to supporting. And this is actually the local game store in Omaha. This is Spielbound. Um, and that's their open box collection. <laughs> so, that's a very, that's a very pretty game store. It is. They're a game store and cafe, and they are beautiful. And if you're in Omaha, you should go. So. <laughs> All right, uh, display. Um, I already talked about this a little bit. We tried dummy dummy cases. They did not work. Um, we keep all of our games out uh, for the public. Um, they can play in, in, in the library, or they can check them out. Either is fine. The um, We had them in bags at one point in time just for convenience and keeping everything together, but people needed to see the cover. So at this point in time, I have them all on mobile carts, um, box top facing out. So you get to see all this beautiful artwork. Um, it's close to the uh, Cirque station. So as people walk in, if they're interested, staff can really quickly um, you know, ask if they have questions, offer to demo a game. Um, these games I have right in front, the, the games in the pictures are actually all donations from patrons. After a while, we've started ask, getting people asking if they, we can donate games um, as they donate books. Uh, which is a pretty good deal. I would say about half these games um, are in the process of going into circulation. Munchkin, Guildhall, Eminent Domain. Uh, the other ones I sort of leave out for uh, gaming events. I guess, were there any other questions that I didn't hit for gaming collections? Uh, the only, um, not for like putting it together a collection thing, but one that maybe relates to what you're getting into now about um, what advice do you have for starting a game culture in the library, basically getting awesome. a program going. Um, she says, I'm sure we have board game aficionados in our community, but we don't have any programs or games right now. So I guess, like, how do you get started from get them Oh, I would, I would say you're, you're, you should first visit... I'm sorry, I'm skipping through your no, stuff okay. already. No, hey, no, that's perfectly <laughs> fine. Because that's meet what up. I was going to say. <laughs> Go meet to Meetup. Up. You really need, I, I wish I could do like a poll to see if anyone's used Meetup, and you really, really need to. Um, I, think, I think I have a better example. The next slide is a detail of the actual event page, yeah. Yeah. So this was an event at uh, Collingswood uh, Public Library uh, where I was uh, doing some um, uh, gaming events. Um, I would have a monthly event, Playboard Games, featuring this one I featured, Flashpoint Fire Rescue, which is a really awesome but somewhat fiddly uh, cooperative game. It shows people who went. Um, I've never, I mean, has anyone ever used a li some library software for events and have people actually converse about the event beforehand and after? Probably no. <laughs> Meetup is really good at <laughs> Meetup's goal is to facilitate community. That's what they want. Hmm. Um, so when I do like this one, Collingswood Modern Board and Card Gamers, it's not Collingswood Library. Um, it's not Ben Salem Library or or whatever library I'm working with. It is um, the area. So I want people to um, play the games, show up at our, our at our events. Uh, eventually, you'll start getting some regulars, you'll get some high quality volunteers. Mm -hmm. Recently we had one of our volunteers uh, buy us a huge board gaming banner for display, oh, which was amazing. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. Um, we actually had somebody show up at one of our uh, the, the game nights at Messenger with a game that they were developing too. Um, oh, that's really cool. It was really cool. I mean, and they had it like they had a, a first run print of it, so it wasn't just you know written on cardboard type things. Um, but it was effectively both promotional for them and kind of a beta test. Like, okay, this is how this works. It was really neat. Um, we can keep talking about Meetup if you know that's that's fine. Yeah, we can I, stay there. Um, I was because <laughs> that's actually a really good place to start when you want to see what's already going on in your area. Um, yep. There is a, a small cost for Meetup if you're the organizer, like if you want to create a group either for your area or your library. Um, and, and in Illinois, the way we sort of got around that was our partnership with the local gaming store, they already had a meetup, and there was already a meetup group for kind of like a geek catch-all. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they had they had game nights pretty regularly, but they were in somebody's home. And mm. 
having being a Meetup user when you you know I just moved to Huntsville, I'm gonna be a little bit you know not quite so sure about going to somebody's house who I've never met before. You know, um, so we were able to as you know as a participant or as a member of that Meetup suggest a Meetup, and then if enough people say hey yeah I want to go to that, it'll show up on the page, um, and so we were able to get some traffic that way as well. Um, okay, we so. Oh, go ahead, John. I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say a good thing with Meetup is um, providing your attendees with some sense of agency. Um, mm -hmm. I, after a while, when we pick up some good volunteers, I'll open up um, them to schedule events outside the library. They'll schedule events um, at uh, game shops or cafes or Panera or wherever. Um, but I think giving, if you want to build a community, providing a little bit of that agency is really, really a, a good step towards it. Um, Definitely. After I left uh, Upper Darby Library where I had a game group, it went on with good momentum for about two years afterwards with no library like intervention. Like it just rolled on, right. um, which was really nice to see. Um, <laughs> right. So yeah, it, I would say meet, simple answer, meet up. <laughs> well, build community at your library. Yes. You, it is worth it. Okay. So, um, before you go on, I just want to yeah. let everyone know um, we are a little after eleven o'clock, about an hour from when we started the show um, today. But um, we will continue until uh, John and Marty are done with their presentation. Um, and I know some of you may have to leave if you've only allowed, you know, an hour for our show as you um, as we normally do. But we'll go until we're done, and the whole thing will be on the recording. So if you miss anything near the end, um, that you can come back later and um, watch the rest of the recording. All right, so, Marty, do you want to go ahead with game groups? I certainly can. Yeah. Right. So game groups are actually how John and I both started with games and libraries, as opposed to a circulating collection. Um, so we can switch to the, yep. So um, these are guidelines, the Meeple's guidelines. And John already said Meeple's are those little, those little people tokens like you see on the shelf there. Um, and this is kind of just some good base rules for how to approach um, creating a, 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 game, a gaming event at your library, whether that's a monthly thing or a biweekly thing. Um, or whatever. The first one is moderate, and that's moderate, don't play. Um, you're, mod you're the host of the event, okay? Um, you're, you're, it's your party. You're going to go there to teach and keep games moving at a good pace, and also to just, you know, make sure everybody's having a good time. Um, part of that is having expectations of behavior, um, and that's, that's basically kindergarten rules, you know? Um, it's pretty, but you need to communicate those. You don't have to, you know, come down hard. Um, and say, Arr. but you, you know, just make sure everybody knows that they're there to have a good time. Um, you want to encourage new players and experienced players to interact, and also I would say encourage all players to try things they've not tried before. Um, you want to provide a safe, supportive environment for new players, and you also want to challenge experienced players, and that's what's going to keep them coming back. Um, as, as a female, walking into to some game stores, at least, you know, when I was in high school, so, you know, a, long, a while ago, um, it can be a little intimidating, especially when they're those sort of experienced gamers only type, you know, things where not everyone's playing a board game, or if they are, it's one of those really intense ones, or it's that Warhammer thing, or magic, or it's, it can be scary, you know, so you want to provide a, a very welcoming atmosphere. You want to be lenient when it comes to mistakes and confusion, especially people are learning these games. Um, you, you're teaching, you know, be, be easy. <laughs> and last of all, smile, have a good time, laugh. Like I said, you're all there just to, to have fun. Yeah, also, I think the last one is the most important. Um, yes. But, I mean, sort of cheesy sounding, but <laughs> in I mean, it totally, we get so many people using the library who comment on how much fun it seems everyone's having in there and what we're doing and if they can join, if it's an open program. I used to have my programs out in a in an open space in the library, in a public space, not in a, in a meeting room, and it was, it was good until the, the point where we were having too much fun. <laughs> it, it was getting too distracting to other other patrons, and on you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I got yelled at by librarians. It was amazing. <laughs> That's not a bad thing to have happen. Um, no, totally. <laughs> so thing. I know. I think um, the the question there was the question of how many people to sort of plan for. Um, I generally had anywhere from seven to twelve people each month. John, I think, gets about twenty per event. He has his events biweekly. Ours were once a month. Um, it just depends. On you know when you're first starting out, you're all, you know you're gonna have less people. I think I had ten 
at our first event in Illinois. Um, so I'll have to reach out to Saddlebrook and ask them. I think they're having their first one this week, so I'll have to ask them how many people they get. Um, but you know, having have a variety of games, and we'll get into the game menu too. And like we said before, you want games that are going to play at least four people and up. Um, if you have a bunch of two-player games, you're not going to get the interaction you want. So plan for, I would say, about seven to ten for your first, and then you can kind of get a good gauge. And you'll see, you know, people will bring friends. They'll say, oh, I can't make it next next event, but I'll make the next one after that. And and it, it gets really cool. You'll get that core group of about ten people. Um, at least we did. John, John I'm assuming, how big is your core group? Oh, we get about, I don't know, I think five or six people who are regulars. They come to about every event. Um, and then about half of the rest pop in now and again. And then yeah. there, we get about four or five new ones, like completely new. And sometimes they don't come back. Sometimes they're just there for that one time. Um, I, I usually recommend having uh, – one staff person or volunteer per four people to start mm -hmm. um, just to be able to teach games. And that may only be for like the first event because once you get that core group showing up and you're if you're teaching a new game every time, bring that game to the next event so right. that those relatively new people will go, I know that game. I played it last time. I can teach this game. Let's play this game over there. Mm -hmm. And that way you get people sort of being self-sufficient in there rather than having to teach it. At exactly. this point in time, I don't need to be in the room. Mm -hmm. I basically set up the stuff. They show up. I go back to working, unfortunately. <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot more when I could hang out in the room. <laughs> yeah, and it'll, it'll definitely it'll get to the point where it basically runs itself. Um, kind of segueing into promotions with that, um, in, at Messenger Library, we had that partnership with our local game store, and we actually did, we started our program in September, um, and we had a little sort of like a frequent gamer card that we punched every, every event you came to for the four months into December, and we had a $20, $20 gift card to the local game store. So if you came to, you know, for each punch you had on your card, for those first four events, that was your name in a hat, and at the December program, we drew we drew a winner, and um, they got they got a gift card. So that was a really cool thing to to kind of establish that core group, like keeping the another reason for them to come back. Um, I, so yeah. <laughs> I also want to um, say this picture is the um, the the first board gaming event at the Ben Salem Library. This is who showed up. Oh. <laughs> um, the the next the next one I had I had I think about ten people show up, so I mean it's it's worth giving it a few tries, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but yeah, that was my first one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as promotion goes, obviously there's the traditional promotion you can do, you know, signage in the library. We actually went out in Aurora to the. Um, the colleges, both the graduate school and the undergraduate school, and posted things on bulletin boards there, coffee shops. We used the library's Facebook page and other social media accounts, and meet up. <laughs> and like I said before, we were lucky enough, we had that partnership with the local game store um, because our library was really small. We, they couldn't, at that point, justify getting their own meetup presence, um, but we were able to sort of piggyback on some other people to get people um, knowing about our event and coming to our event. There, there's also a way of, I mean, if you're, if you don't want to spend the money on your own meetup account, um, if there's it's not a that local, much. I mean, we keep saying about not. it, but it's, it's really yeah. not that much. <laughs> um, I think, I think it's eighty dollars a year for me right now. Um, but you can always, if you find a local meetup group that has similar interests to what you're doing, usually the administrators of that group are more than happy to, mm -hmm. to, to put your. You can suggest a meetup, and if you get a few people to RSVB to it, it goes public to everybody. Yep. So really, you can use it without. Right. And one of the cool things about meetup that we've already talked about, um, you can add, you can see here. Oh, can you go back one, John? Yep. Sorry. The add a photo here. So um, before an event, you you know you're we're going to be playing Ticket to Ride. If you already have a picture of Ticket to Ride that you know in progress playing, or you want to sort of stage one. <laughs> Post it up there, and that's more advertisement for you. And then, obviously, after the fact, this is a great place to, you know, because the event doesn't go away. This was, you know, from two days ago when I snapped the screenshot. Um, having those post-event photos so someone can say, oh, hey, that looked like it was a really fun time. When are they doing it again? Um, and that'll help advertise you as well. You can also embed um, 
video. So I would usually <laughs> embed a if the game I'm teaching is on is on Starlet Citadel, I would mm -hmm. embed that video, and everybody pretty much watches it and then comes in with an understanding of the game. Right. Okay, so game menu or you know your set list. What do you offer? Um, I generally feature one main game, which takes the majority of the time, and this is one of the things I use Board Game Geek for as far as searching based on the the play time. You know, 45 minutes um, and up kind of thing, because you know you're only going to have the program for you know two hours or something like that. Um, and then you know I'd pad it with a couple smaller games. You know whether those are technically filler games like Farmageddon there, um, or just something that's not going to take as much time. Maybe it has a 30-minute play time as opposed to a 60-minute play time. Um, sometimes those games share a theme, like Gloom, Zombie Dice, and One Night Ultimate Werewolf for Halloween. It's a great lineup. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, I think the, the plan for Saddlebrook is La Boca, which is an abstract game um, based on, uh, I'm trying to, remember the city, uh, a city, architecture in a city in South America, um, and Skull, which has that sort of Day of the Dead kind of feel to it, and then Panic Lab. So, you know, trying to tie in Hispanic Heritage Month, but also having some fun, too. Um, the local game store you partner with or even just talk to may be willing to give you a demo copy from their open box collection and even come out to help you teach. Um, so they're, you know, don't forget them as a resource if you can build that partnership. Um, one thing I do want to point out is you need to remember to scaffold when you're building your menu. So if you've never, if you've never introduced a mechanic before, you know, you know your players have never played a cooperative game, start with something that's a little bit simpler. Um, so maybe start with Forbidden Island or Hanabi, if you want to do cooperatives, as opposed to jumping right into something like Arkham Horror or Pandemic. Um, start, start simple, because you're teaching, you know, and that's going to be something else that brings people back, you know. You, you may feature Forbidden Island one, one month or one week and say, hey, you remember Forbidden Island? This plays really similarly. Let's try that next. All right, let's talk about some games. So the games that are going to be listed are the ones I have um, as the seed collection for each of the branches in our system. Um, so these are games you can find anywhere. They've served really well at my branch, so I'm expanding them to other branches. Um, and they're ones that we, in our system we're going to have multiple copies of. So if you have questions about which games have multiple copies, these are the ones. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Pandemic. Um, this is a cooperative game. I do recommend cooperative games for a starting collection and for game events uh, because you can teach the rules while you play. Um, if people are sort of, if you're a little introverted or you're not really, you, you don't, you're not really big into jumping into heavy competition with strangers, a cooperative game is a great way to get everyone together to play. Uh, Pandemic. It plays in less than, it plays in like 45 minutes. Plays four people, two to four people. One, I guess one to four if you want to play it by yourself. Um, and we're going to have uh, six copies of this game. Um, it's almost always checked out. I never see it. That, okay. Uh, Seven Wonders. This one I is a great gateway game. It's a little bit more complex than others. Um, it's very it's um, friendly competition, I think. It, it's very laid back. Um, you're uh, card drafting and building a little civilization um, in front of you to score points at the end of the game. It's one of the ones that requires a few playthroughs to really get. Like you can learn the mechanisms the first time you play, the second time you start picking up the strategy. It, it takes a little bit. This is one that I have at a few branches. I'm not giving it to each one, but the current copy we have, again, I, I rarely ever see it. It's definitely worth to have a couple of copies if you have a larger system or library. At least one. It also plays seven people, as the name suggests, which is sort of rare and really cool. That's, yeah, that's really cool. Um, one Night Ultimate Werewolf. Great game for teens. <laughs> Any of the werewolf games are great for teens. Um, it plays a big group. You can get a free app that will guide the game. So basically, you don't need to really host it. You can just use the app along with it. Um, it's a deduction game. You got to figure out you're a, you're a villager or you're a werewolf, and if you're a, a villager, you want to figure out who the werewolves are. If you're a werewolf, you don't want to be found out. Um, it plays in about 10 minutes, so it's quick. It tends to be loud. It requires maybe a somewhat animated, extroverted group. I've had this game sort of fall flat with with a group of introverts. 
like myself, um, but whatever, it, it's what happens. Um, it's a lot of fun, also cheap. It's one of the ones that we're going to have for a few branches. It has expansions too, right? That ex, you know add the roles. Oh, so, daybreak. Yeah, there's yeah, there's daybreak. Yeah, so you can make it more and more complex if if people are getting a little. Right, and I think you can actually add people. Like it plays a large number already, but I, if I remember correctly, if you have the expansions, you have more roles. So you can see some of the tokens here. There's the werewolves to one side, but then you have a villager and seer, and I think one's a traitor. I can't remember them all. Yeah, um, I but it adds more roles and you can get more people. Yeah, exactly. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. The Resistance <laughs> and the Resistance Avalon. Um, another social deduction game. Uh, small box. Um, plays a relatively larger group. I think it's a two to six, three to six players. Um, it's a great game for teens and young adults. Um, it's fairly simple to learn. Same concept sort of as in Werewolf where you are um, in the resistance or a spy um, and you got to figure out who's who. Another good one for teens. Sushi Go. Um, so if you're thinking about doing Seven Wonders, um, Sushi Go is a good one to start with. It's a very simple and, I have to say, adorable card drafting game, or pick and pass, as, mm -hmm. as I guess they're calling it. Um, it. It's a lot of fun. You're basically collecting different types of sushi with adorable faces in order to score points at the end of the game. It plays a good amount of people. Um, it's inexpensive. Um, it's 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 currently in print. It was it was reprinted. It used to be hard to, harder to find now. Game right games, mm -hmm. I think. Yep. Game it is right. Distributing it. It's um, it's a good one. Also, I think I, saw it, I think I saw it at Target recently too. Like I, I saw it in a really oh, weird. Yeah, I cool. think so. Um, but I remember being oh my goodness, they have Sushi Go. So yep. <laughs> it's a good one. I would definitely check it out. It comes in a nice little tin. Beautiful. Um, this, I guess, is the one that sort of started it all for yeah, some I could say people. That. Yeah. It is. It's certainly okay. So uh, I think it's now called Catan, right? With an exclamation mark. It's not. Oh the settlers yeah. Of Catan anymore, the new I one. think people refer um, to it as Catan. I mean, the settlers yeah. of just gets dropped off a lot. So I call, I call it settlers. I'm just strange. yeah. Um, <laughs> it's it's the granddaddy of modern board games. Um, it's one that we're going to have at each of our branches. Um, I really, really like it. It's easy to teach. You will, if you get even just a few people who are somewhat experienced with modern board games at your groups, it'll be there. Um, there's a lot of expansions for it, so you mm -hmm. can always um, add a little bit of um, diversity to it. Um, if you'd like, there's historical version. There's a lot of okay. stuff with Catan. So we're getting. It is the uh, granddaddy, but it's. It, I, I, I do want to point out, not it. It doesn't really jive with everybody. Um, okay. Just, just you know, it's awesome and totally at it, but. Just not everyone's gonna love it, for, as okay. far as game nights go. You know, sorry. <laughs> it's also it's also a little pricey for yeah. um for what I mean I think the the order the copies we got are about forty four bucks. That um, sounds so about it's right. A little yeah. bit much. Yeah. Um, but it will move. People will know how to play it. It it's right. a good pick. Oops. Forward. Uh -oh. Carcassonne, another one of those granddaddies. I think it's like the trifecta. You have Settlers, you have Carcassonne, and you have uh, Ticket to Ride. Ticket, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So Carcassonne, really simple uh, tile placement game. We're going to have one at all of our uh, branches. It has a lot of tiny little mini expansions you can purchase. Um, so if you want a little bit more complexity after a while, you can add a few of those to it as well. Um, it's Great for circling because if those meeples, those little, there's a meeple, <laughs> there's a meeple. Um, if they get lost, they're really easy to replace. If you lose a few tiles, it really doesn't affect gameplay that much. Um, so it, it should have a good long uh, shelf life. Mm -hmm. Splendor. This is a newer one. I've actually only played this one time, but I've heard so many people love it, and people would bring it constantly to our uh, board gaming events, um, and you are basically s collecting gems to purchase cards uh, to score a certain number of points at the end of the game. It's very not competitive. I mean, it can be a little bit, but it's friendly. It's very easy to learn. It plays really quickly. It's got nice big chunky discs that come with it. Um, it's another newer one that we're picking up. This one you may not find at Target or 
I don't know. You probably find it at Barnes and Noble. I'm not really sure, uh, but you should be able to order it online. Really good one. Um, and this is another one that's going to all the branches. Ticket to Ride. Um, it's another awesome. one of those. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, so Ticket to Ride. Um, you are uh, gaining points by building connections between different cities on a map. Um, it's a good gateway game. It's very easy to teach. Uh, you can, there are lots of different with... versions of it too. Like the base game is the United States, but there's one that's what Nordic countries. There's a is there an Asia one now. There's all kinds of different there's, maps. Yeah, there's, there's, so, yeah. There's, there's, Nordic countries plays two to three people. So if you wanted a smaller one that plays quicker, that's a great one. That's my favorite one. Um, there's Europe that has a few extra mechanics to it. Uh, so you can get a few of these um, or just all the base set. Um, it's very popular. I like it. You'll find it at Target. Mm -hmm. Good game to pick up. And uh, from the from the same designer that brought you Pandemic, um, you have Forbidden Island and Forbidden Desert. Um, Forbidden Island is one of my favorites. It was one of the first uh, modern board games I played. It's one of the more popular ones. It's a great it's a great simple cooperative game. It plays great with kids. It plays pretty good with teens. It plays good with adults. Uh, and if super you want easy to teach. Yeah. It's super if, easy to teach. If you want something a little bit more difficult and complicated, Forbidden, Forbidden Desert is the same basic mechanic, um, but with a lot of added stuff to it. So, um, and it's a lot more intense. Um, yeah, I don't think. I don't. Island. I don't like. Di I'd rather. I don't. You can't really drown in Forbidden Island, but you sure as heck. Dude, oh, it's easy. Desert. It's so easy to die in Forbidden Desert. <laughs> uh, I, I don't like dying there. Uh, but no, they're great games. They come in nice, pretty tins. Some people hate tins. Libraries should just love tins because they look very nice and people always pick them out. They're shiny. And I, I have not seen Forbidden Island in six months. <laughs> I, I think it's still there. I, I should check. Um, it just gets circed uh, pretty often. Well, it's also talking... really. Oh, go ahead. It's also a good one for game groups. Um, yes, I was going to say, when, I'm, when I scaffolded uh, cooperative games at Messenger, we started with Forbidden Island, we moved to Forbidden Desert, and then we did Pandemic, um, because that's, it's just a great scale on yeah. that. Um, you were talking before about pieces, and I know both of these have some really unique pieces. You can see on the Tidal Palace and Hollowed Ground on Forbidden Island, on that picture, those little icons are actually pieces in the game. Um, have, those have not gone missing at all, have they? Um, nope. On yours, yeah. No, so, and they're also not really needed for gameplay. If they do go missing, you can replace it with something else. I mean, if you really had to, um, they're it. These are the same people that make uh, Sushi Go, mm -hmm. um, Game Right, um, and they've been pretty good with uh, uh, replacement parts if needed. They've they've been very they they've communicated really well. I like um, to think the best of people, and I know that that's that's hard to do when you work in circulation sometimes. It's true. Um, but you know what? I mean, people know that this goes together, and you're yep. nine times out of ten, I think even more than that, you're going to get everything back together, especially when it, they're those little specialty pieces. So yeah. it was one of the biggest concerns. Yeah. Was. Well, my pieces are going to be missing left and right, and I have not seen it. Mm -hmm. it that's one pieces, of the things. It, everything pretty much comes back. That people asking questions, there's like at least four different people that typed in questions wanting to know how do you keep track of the pieces? What about missing pieces? What do you do when they go? <laughs> so, and so there's, there's, it's a concern, yeah. obviously. You know, I lose yeah, pieces I to games in my own house, but. <laughs> I would say definitely inventory the pieces in the box. That's important. Um, bag every separate piece. Uh, Make sure it's inventoried on the bag so people can put the right amount in there. I think helping out people mm -hmm. as much as possible and putting everything away works. Um, other than that, I, I haven't had much difficulty. If you really want a quick way of, of checking in, if you have a, um, a very good scale at your library, like a, uh, like, like like a, a postage, postage scale, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you weigh it before and just have that weight there, and when they come back in, weigh it, make sure that it's pretty close huh. and it's good to go back out. Um, we do that at the few branches that actually uh, – my branch has one of those, and I've done it a few times. It works, but I haven't had pieces go missing that much anyway. Mm. Um, but at least I'll tell you if something big is gone. Um, we don't charge for replacement pieces, which is another question. Um, mm. any, any pieces that do go missing, I just locate, and I have budgeted for some extra pieces. And also I think publishers are generally pretty good at, at, at sending stuff at, at a low cost. 
Um, I do replace for, um, I, I do charge for uh, destroyed games. So if someone, no one has done this, but if someone spilled coffee on the board or if the cards came back completely torn up, um, patron would be charged for uh, the replacement cost of the game. But for something like, I mean, Forbidden Island, it's going to cost you 12 bucks. So yeah. whatever. It's not that bad. Oops. That was not what I wanted to do. All right. I guess, it, are there any other questions? I know we went over time. Oh, which yeah. Is awesome. I hope people are still here. There. Oh, yes. Actually, most of the people have stuck around with us. Thank oh, you so yeah, much. We're for awesome. You. <laughs> A few people did have to leave and said, sorry, i got to go and whatnot. But, yeah. Understandable. Um, yes. Does anybody have any last-minute questions you want to toss in before we do wrap up this uh, episode? Um, I, I do want to show this. Okay. These are the alignment sheets that I made for the mm -hmm. for each game in the collection. Nice. So mm -hmm. if we could link to that somewhere. Sure, afterwards. yeah. Send me that link and send me your slides so I can I'll, so I can put them up um, with a little recording. Absolutely, yeah. These um, technical services will not let me uh, put in a new board game without making one of these sheets. So if you have them <laughs> already, it basically has everything they need to get it into the catalog. Catalogers, yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and John, when you say when you say alignments, um, I want to point out, and I and I know it's on that slide. There's actually yeah. you you aligned them with was it curriculum standards for your local? Yeah, I did with uh, yeah, I aligned each game with uh, uh, local and and core curriculum standards. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. I did that because I was expecting some um, a little pushback that I didn't actually get, but it was good to be prepared. If people right. ask you. I don't know why. Like, why would why you is the library spending the li money? Why does a library have games? You'd be like, because these games teach kids to be awesome. Right. <laughs> well, and not only like not only can you link it up with the curriculum standards that you know are applicable to your community, but you can also use the Search Institute's um, developmental assets and needs inventory, um, which basically is you know things that adolescents and children need to you know become awesome adults, and mm -hmm. they link up so well with that. Um, Sorry, I love the Search Institutes thing. It's really cool. Um, cool. And that's obviously things that we, we say, you know, these are for kids and teens, but obviously anybody's going to benefit from that positive social interaction. So mm -hmm. um, We do have a question that did come in. Um, and I think this is more actually, they want to, what is the website you mentioned earlier that will send the library sample games? I think there's just the one, well, there's the oh, list the, that's yeah. on the mm -hmm. library and gamers Facebook. Yeah, League, on the Facebook group, yeah. But yeah, you had League mentioned. of Librarian Gamers. Um, there is a they have a a list of publishers that have been contacted for games and and the positive or negative result. Right. So and that can, link will be right. included out in the recording, so you'll get access to that. I've already put it in our delicious uh, awesome. list there. Yeah. Um, and we just have one comment. Um, Lori is on from Omaha here. Yes, and she said actually Saddlebrook's first game for grownups is tomorrow night. Awesome. So if you're in the area, get head over there, and um, she'll let you know, Marty, how it goes. Awesome. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Good job, Marty. <laughs> well, hey, you know, it's it's in her hands now, and, yeah, it's going to be awesome. I have every every faith in that, so it'll be good. There, and we actually were able to partner with Spielbound a lot for that. We went and, and got to try it. We weren't sure what we were going to do as far as our game menu goes, and so we were able to play a couple things and make that decision, and they were really supportive and awesome, so All right. I hope that continues. Yeah. Well, I guess if anyone has other questions, you can always contact me. Um, or me, yeah. <laughs> if, you join, if you join the League of uh, Librarian Gamers, um, I'm, I try to be pretty active there. Um, so you can totally ask questions to a whole bunch of people that know a lot about games and libraries, and they will be able to help you out. Yep. They're really awesome. That group is really awesome and supportive and just all kinds of great ideas. So. So I guess we're good with questions. Yeah. <laughs>